love what David said. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Everything that's in me, right? There's a lot of gook in me. There's some good things that the Lord placed inside of you, right? There's some gifts. All that's within me do what? Bless his home. Despite what's going on around me, he's still worthy. Amen. He's still worthy of the praise. Amen. He's good, is he not? The worship team just talked about and sang about how good he is. Is he not good? We serve a good guy. You can take your seats. Amen. I'm excited about this series. We're still traveling and traversing through the book of Romans. Are you enjoying the sermon series? Amen. I love the book of Romans. Book of Romans, many refer to it as the constitution of the Christian faith. And Paul, um, the Holy Spirit was in his own when he was inspiring Paul to write this letter to the church in Rome. But before we dive into it, and the AV team, they're going to put some, some pictures on the screen. Imagine, if you will, you are at an airport. You're at an airport, and you're rushing to catch a flight. Why? Because you you overslept. You hit the snooze button way too many times this time, and guess what? Man, you're late. And so you're at the airport. You're booking it. You're in a full Olympic sprint, if you will, and you're trying to make it to your gate. Traffic was crazy, and now you're at the airport, and the TSA line is look like it's not even moving. It's moving at a snail, like, like, you, uh, like a snail was running a marathon or something, right? And, and, and it's not moving, and you're just like, you're panicking. You're panicking. And so you're sweating. Your heart is pounding, and you, you just arrive at the gate, and you hear these words over the loudspeaker. Flight blah, blah, blah is now boarding, right? You hear this, and you're like, man, I'm flight blah, blah, blah. Man, I'm supposed to be on that plane. And so, man, you whip out your ticket, and you barely make it, and then the check-in woman is looking at you all strange, right, looking you up and down. I know what that means when you look somebody from the feet up, right? It means you want to fight, all right? And so guess what? It's not that serious, lady. We just, I'm just trying to get on my plane. And so you're on the plane. Your heart is racing still. You find your seat. The plane takes off, and then something happens. Something real special happens. You take a deep breath. You look out the window if you got a window seat, right? And suddenly there's this overwhelming sense of peace. This overwhelming sense of peace that just overtakes you and envelops you. And you haven't reached your destination yet, but the stress is over. You made it. You don't have to rush through the airport in Atlanta anymore. I'm, I made it. That airport gets on my nerves. All right? It's like I'm waiting for a subway to have it. Like, I'm taking a subway? I don't get it. But the stress is over. You made it. And that, my friends, is what it's like to find peace with God. That's exactly what it's like to find peace with God. Once you know that you've made it into a covenant relationship with God, there's a peace that settles over your soul that you can't explain. Amen? And so we're going to explore what that peace looks like and how it holds on to us, even when times become turbulent. Can we do that? All right. And so for all the note takers out there, we have a QR code on the back of the chair that's in front of you. If you want to follow along, we have some sermon notes there. You just simply scan that QR code and you can follow along. For all the Bible thumpers like me, open up your Bibles. All right. Open up the, I just love the way the the pages sound. Anybody love God's word? I mean, love God's word. I mean, even the maps, right, in the back. I mean, I'm looking at the map. I'm like, Paul went there? Man, good night. All right, Paul, I see you. All right. And so we love God's word. So we're going to open up to Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 1. If you have an e-device, go ahead and turn those on and power those up. All right. We're continuing this series in the book of Romans. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome. And um, Paul actually wrote about 13 out of 27 books of the New Testament. He wrote this around 57 AD. And so, man, Paul is writing to the church there, and it reads as follows. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord 
Jesus Christ. Amen. And so in order to really understand this scripture, it starts out by saying, therefore. And my teachers, they told me when you're going through the Bible and you're studying God's word, you got to find out what the therefore was there for. Amen. And so you're going to have to go back just a little bit to understand what Paul is talking about here. And he's referring to the life of Abraham over in Romans 4, the chapter before, Romans 4, through 24. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted unto him righteousness. And Pastor Travis talked about that, I believe, last week. And so justification, when we get to this word justification, since we have been justified, it's the act of God whereby he forgives the unsaved person's sins. He forgives our sins. And not only does he forgive our sins, right? We hear that word, but he, imagine someone who could forgive sin. Who could do, who, who could forgive more wrongdoing? We serve a God who does that. And so he forgives our sin and then he inputs into us. He gives us righteousness. He credits to us righteousness. And so the perfect one, Jesus Christ, he died in your place, right? You deserve to die, but God gave us life and man, he justified us. And it's as if we never sinned. And so now let's find out what the results of that justification is. Can we do that? And so let's move on. Romans 5.1, it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus. Peace with God through the Lord Jesus. What did Paul know? What did Paul, what was Paul addressing right here? He was addressing the problem that even back then in 57 AD, people were, were living life without peace. They were living life without peace. Like many of us today, we're living life without peace. This phrase, this phrase is being thrown around and I've had some conversations with some some people at this church, even at work and just out in the community. And this is a phrase that's being thrown around. And and it's this, you've probably heard it, you probably even used it yourself. Life be lifing. Maybe I'm alone. Y'all ain't ain't working with me over here. I'm going to go over here. Maybe some regular people, right? And life be lifing. Does it not? For real. Life be lifing. Or maybe you may say something like this. Life is lifing, y'all. You're on the phone with your homegirl, and you're just like, man, how was your day, man? Life is lifing. And who here knows what it's like to feel overwhelmed by life? I mean, just feel overwhelmed with life. And if we're honest, life is wild. Life is stressful and stress is everywhere. People are dealing with anxiety. People are dealing with depression and everything in between, right? We're going to our therapist and our therapist is probably saying in their mind, man, here she come or here he come. All right. I know my therapist is like that. And a recent study found this out. A recent study found this out that 70% of millennials and Gen Z report feeling overwhelmed by life's pressures on a daily basis. Here's what we know. Jobs are uncertain. Relationships can be toxic. And social media, don't let me get started with, don't let me get started with the the, the scroll, right? Don't let me get started with the scroll. You're scrolling through other people's highlight reels while you feel like you're stuck in your own blooper reel. The, 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 the scroll is, can be deadly at times. We're comparing our lives with the next person's lives, and it's no wonder that we're craving peace so badly. But here's the thing. True peace doesn't come from just making it through the next day. True peace doesn't come from just paying off your debt, and I salute you for paying off your debt. I'm really inside Dave Ramsey screaming for you right now saying, I'm dead free. I'm, I'm that guy for you. I'm proud that you was able to put your ducks and butterflies in formation and pay off your debt. But that doesn't create true peace, right? Even reaching your next career milestone, that, that doesn't create true peace. And many of this room know that to be true because you've met your next career milestone and life is what? Still chaotic. It's still stressful. 
you're still battling with depression, right? And you're still coming in here Sunday after Sunday, hoping that God will give you a word. And I believe that he has a word for you. And it's found in this word surrounding about peace with God. And I know what it's like, right? I'm, you're not alone. I know what it's like to chase after peace in the wrong places. Anybody been there? You've chased after peace in the wrong places, thinking that success, thinking that status, thinking that stuff will calm the chaos. And what you found to be true is that that's not true. Real peace is way deeper than that. And I love the way the saint, Augustine, he puts it like this. Augustine was a, a theologian, right? We get it confused with Augustine, which is a city in Florida, but this is the, the theologian. And he said this, you have made us for yourselves. We were made for God. He said this, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. See, we're putting our hearts in the wrong places. We're placing our hearts in the wrong vehicle and it's leading us to restlessness, in some cases, chronic restlessness. Have you ever seen someone who just can't sit still? Like, bro, sit down. Right? I had a family member who was like this. Every time he would come through the door, man, guess what, man? He, hey, he, he was in the streets real bad, so he would, you know, hey, toss the money to me. Hey, count this. He'd hop in the shower, take a shower, come out. Man, should I wear these shoes or these shoes? Should I wear these? It's like, where are you going? You was just out for four Like, sit down, rest, calm down. But you know what the truth was? His heart was restless. His heart was restless. His heart was restless. Peace without God. When we have peace without God, first off, it's pseudo peace. It's fake peace. It's fake peace. And here's the thing, we're no different than that, that traveler that's racing through the airport, hoping to get to our destination, right? Thinking that the plane has taken off without us. That's what we're, that's how, that's how we're in. We're in this endless cycle. And so why, this is a question, why do we keep chasing after peace in the wrong places? Why? Could it be that we don't realize that peace actually starts with God? Peace starts with God, not with stuff, not with status, not with, get this, success. It starts with God. And so now that we've hammered out um, the problem, right, chasing after peace in all the wrong places, let's kind of dive into a, a, a solution. And the solution is this, peace with God happens and starts it starts with Jesus. Amen. You see, the good news, the good news you, is this, that you don't, you don't chase after peace. And a lot of us are real good, myself included. We're good at chasing after peace. But you don't have to chase after peace. Peace is actually chasing you. The Bible says while we were yet sinners. Amen. And so while I was busy doing my thing, God was setting up parameters. He was setting up, um, he was setting up the scene to, to save you, to pursue you, and to give you eternal peace through the death and resurrection of his son, Christ Jesus. Amen? And so let's get back over into Romans 5.1. It tells us that peace with God comes through Christ Jesus. What does it mean to have peace with God? And so in order for me to really explain and unpack what it means to have peace with God, I need to really take a step back and tell you what this is not, all right? I want to tell you what peace with God isn't. And so first off, it's not psychological peace. And psychological peace isn't bad. I don't want to send that message, all right? Psychological peace has its place. But first off, it's self-centered, all right? Psychological peace is often viewed as something an individual can take, can work towards, right? through his own efforts. But so this isn't that, all right? Peace with God isn't psychological peace. It's also temporary and dependent, all right? It's temporary because here's the thing, circumstances that can happen that can disrupt that peace and all of a sudden you no longer have psychological peace, all right? You're right back at square one. And so it's temporary and it's dependent and it's not peace with God. It's individualistic. I like to use the word. It's a real technical term. It's meistic. 
It's real meistic. It's primarily concerned with the inner state of an individual and it's inwardly focused and it's not peace with God. All right. I love what Romans 8, 7 says in the NIV. I love the way the NIV verse it. It says that a sinful mind is hostile to God. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, at the end of all your therapy, and I'm not knocking therapy, I go to therapy twice a month, all right? But at the end of all your therapy, if, it's, if you're not a believer, your mind is hostile to God. The sinful mind is hostile to God. That's why Paul reminds us over in Romans 12, 1, that we have to do what? We have to renew our minds. We have to get into that word and we have to wash it with the word of God. Amen. And so it's not psychological peace. So that's one thing that peace with God isn't. Another thing that peace with God is not, it's not the same as the peace of God. All right, let me slow down right here. Peace of God is a a kind of peace that comes from God, beloved. All right, and this peace is something that you can't explain. It's something that you can't create on your own. Even when things are stressful and out of control and we've all been there, there's a calmness, a a type of peace from God that calms our soul because you know this one truth. He has your back. Has anybody ever been there before? Where, where things were imploding around you, the kids were acting wild, the spouse was acting um, a donkey, um, and then everything, your boss, right? You get to work and your boss is bossing, right? He's not being a team leader. He's being a boss, y'all, all right? And guess what? Everything is imploding around you, but you, God gives you this calm that falls over you and surrounds you and envelops you and you have a peace and everybody's saying, hey girl, ain't that right? Shouldn't we revolt? We need to protest. We don't even have a union. We under-. And you're just like, I'm good. God got me, right? Your, your check came up short and you should be losing your mind. And you normally do, all right? You go give them a piece of your mind. But today, that peace of God is on you. Amen. And so even the things that are stressful and out of control, like, man, they're not even bothering you. And God is doing what? He's actually guarding your heart. He's guarding your heart. Philippians 4.27 says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts. He will guard your heart. And here we are thinking that God is some big ogre in the sky telling us what we can and cannot do, looking for an opportunity to punish us. And that's not true. That's the furthest thing from the truth. He's actually a God that's guarding our hearts and guarding our minds. Imagine being in a tough situation where you're about to take a, a, a college interest exam or maybe ACT or SET or, or maybe it's some issues that's going on at home, a family problem, and everyone is stressing out about it, but you feel calm. That there is the peace of God. When things get crazy, you know that God has your back. Amen. That's what we have. And so what does, it, what does it mean to have peace with God? We know that it's not the peace of God, which is a great thing. It's awesome, right? We know that it's not psychological peace. But what is peace with God? It's actually something that you can't earn. Can't earn this, right? It's not like frequent flyer miles where we get points on our credit card. That's not what this is, right? We're, 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 this is not us trying to prove ourselves, We're not looking anxiously over our shoulder, wondering if we're good enough, because guess what? Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for us. And so I love the way that pastor, the late great pastor, Tim Keller, he once said this. He said that the peace that Jesus gives us is not the absence of trouble, but the confidence. Say confidence. It's the confidence that he is there with you where? Always. Not some of the time. He's always there. He doesn't check out. He doesn't check out on us. And I love it because he says, man, he got that type of, he got that type of peace that sticks around. There's a situation back when I was young. I was probably about 12 years old. Me and my friends, we went up to the corner store. And this was the wrong corner store. Y'all know the wrong corner store. Y'all know the wrong. This is the corner store where all the ops at. Right? This is where all the enemies are, right? And they wanted to go to that one because they had the, the freezy pots that we all. But anyway, yeah. And so we go to that one. 
And we go in, and I see the opposition. I see the enemy come around the corner through the window in the front. And so I said, hey, listen, guys, man, I got some beef in this area. I need y'all to, you know what I'm saying, stick with me. We got, we're going we're to have to go to war, right? This is real. We 12. We're going to war, all right? <laughs> they said, Chauncey, that's your battle, right? And I was just like, what you talking and so we go outside, we exit the corner store, the wrong corner store. We exit the wrong corner store. My friends go that way. I'm stuck right here. The, the, those enemies, the bad guys, they're right there confronting me. And I had to do that fight all by myself. I had to fight that battle all by myself. I wasn't fighting. I, j- I just took out, right, man. I turned into Carl Lewis, and I just sprinted up out of there, man. I never ran so fast in my life. But listen, the type of peace that I'm talking about here, It's the peace that sticks around, even when times get tough, all right? They're not like those um, pseudo friends that I had back then. This type of peace is not fragile. It's not based on your circumstances. It's not based on your performance, this type of peace that I'm talking about here, the peace with God. It's based on who God is. It's based on his character. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. It's based on his character. It's based on his makeup if you will. And here's the draw dropper right here. Here's here's the bottom line. And we really need to get this. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. God is not at war with you. He's not at war with you. God, hostility towards you, it ended at the cross. He emptied out his wrath. He emptied out his beef. He emptied out Every ill will that he had towards you, he emptied out his anger on his son. And we need to carry that truth with us every time we leave the house. We need to carry that truth every time we come home. Amen? God is not angry at you. God is not at war with you. And so this is something that I wish I understand as a, as understood as a young Christian. I wish someone set me down as a teenager and taught me that, listen, God is not at war with you, Chauncey. Because here's what happened. Um, It prevented me from praying regularly. And I'm not the only one, right? I'm not the only one. Some of us are avoiding prayer because we feel unworthy and we feel like God is angry at us. Some of us are avoiding worship. We can't even come into church. And some of you struggled earlier with raising your hands and emptying out your lungs with praise because guess what? You feel that God has hostility against you. And there's nothing further from the truth. Some of us have problems accepting his grace and we're struggling with fully embracing God's grace, thinking that we still need to earn his approval. Newsflash, we can't. And guess what? He knew this. And so he sent his son, amen, to take that wrath, to take that anger. Some of us can't even experience... um, we can't, we can't even share our faith. There are some people that God has been really tugging on our hearts to share our faith with, and we can't because we feel like, um, and we become hesitant because we feel like we're not in right standing with God. And I'm here to tell you that today, that listen, you can share your faith. There's nothing more powerful than your testimony. Somebody needs to hear your testimony. Here's what your testimony has the power to do. In a court of law, it could convict or set free. So imagine what your testimony can do in the life of an unbeliever. It could convict. It can set free. It could help put them in right standing with God. Share your faith. Amen? Share your faith. We're moving through this thing. Because sin loves to separate us. Sin loves to separate and it separates us from God, and, and, and it makes us think that we're not in right position and that God has this pent-up hostility towards us. But here's the thing. He emptied out his wrath on his son. We have been justified, justified as a result. Amen? And, and, and man, we are in right standing with God. There's this situation that happened back when I was young as well. My neighborhood was crazy when growing up. Anybody had a crazy neighborhood? So I got another crazy neighborhood story. Man, I was walking with my, um, my brother, my older brother, and we were going down this, 
the street on the outskirt of my neighborhood. You know how crazy and sketchy those outskirts of your neighborhood can be. Your neighborhood is your comfort zone. But I was on the outskirts, and we was going through, and there was this kid up on the porch. He had this, um, this ugly jacket on. It was an ugly jacket. It was an ugly jacket, all right? And it was a Tennessee jacket. It looked like this. It was orange. It was satin. It looked ugly. And um, the irony of this is I'm a, I'm a devote Tennessee Vols fan. That's the crazy thing. And we, you can clap. You can clap for that right there because we beat Bama last night. <laughs> yeah, we beat Alabama. But anyway, on this story, and so me being the 12-year-old that I was, I'm, start, I'm starting to talk about this kid's jacket. He's on the porch, right? Um, and I'm talking about it. I mean, I'm going in, man. That's an ugly jacket, man. You couldn't pay me to wear that jacket. And I'm saying it loud and obnoxious. I want him to hear me, right? Because I'm thinking I'm big and bad. I'm the fighter in my neighborhood, right? And so I'm thinking like, man, he ain't do nothing to me. Contraire. And so listen, he looked down at me. He started narrowing his eyes and I'm going in, right? I'm being loud. I'm drawing a crowd and attention and everything. And, and then he comes down off the porch and when his foot Hit the sidewalk, something shifted, right? Something shifted. Y'all know that shift that I'm talking about, right? It's, it's when you've, you've talked yourself in something that you can't get yourself out of, right? And so that's exactly what happened. And so we're exchanging words, right? We're going back and forth. It's kind of like a heavyweight match, boxing match. Um, when, they, when they get both of the fighters on the platform and they're talking back and forth, they're talking junk and everything, like them pay-per-view fights, that's what this was. We're going at it. We're going at it. We're like nose to nose going at it. And then a blow exchange, and we get to fighting, and we're going at it. And can I tell y'all that Chauncey was standing on business for a little bit, for a little bit, all right? So I'm on top of this guy. I'm punching him. Pop, 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 pop. I'm throwing blows, right? I'm putting hands on old dude, and then something happened. <laughs> something happened. And, uh, man, he started talking. And he just wasn't, you know, talking trash like on the playground. This guy was a motivational speaker. He started saying, Chauncey, when I get up, it's over. It's over. You a chump. You can't fight. Have you even started swinging yet? He's really going for the juggler right here. And he's just spitting out words. And punch after punch after punch, my confidence began to shrink. And I began to buy in and began to listen to what was happening. And faster and quicker than I could even know it, the tables turned. I was on my back staring up at this kid in an ugly Tennessee jacket, right? And he's punching me and I'm crying. And I wasn't the motivational speaker back then. I'm going through it. I'm like, man, something dawned on me that I was losing and that I was losing badly, right? And so somehow I got the kid off of me. I shrugged him off. I got to my feet and I ran home. I was crying. I was embarrassed. And I had lost the fight. And what that lets me know, what, what the takeaway from that whole story is that my mind never had rest after that. I mean, weeks later, months later, I would walk through that part of the neighborhood and take the long way around. Am I alone? Have I ever... Am, Anybody have done that before, right? It took me an extra 10 minutes to get to where I was going because I didn't want to see the Tennessee kid. Tennessee kid had hands, right? And so my mind was never at rest. And here's what I'm here to tell you, that when a person has peace with God, their mind is at rest about their relationship with God. My mind was never at rest. My brother and my cousins, they still tease me to this day, jokingly, right? It's the inside joke. When I go to, tennis, when I go to um, Cincinnati and I visit and we drive through the old neighborhood and he say, let's go down the street. Let's go see Tennessee. And I'm like, oh, man, here y'all go with that again, right? It, it's trigger warning, even just talking about it, right? It was so traumatic. And so with all that being said, we've, we've kind of hammered out the problem. We handled out the solution. The solution is Jesus, right, in that he absorbed God's wrath, and we have peace with God. And so how, how does that translate organically into our daily lives, all right? And so let's hop into that. I got three C's that's going to help us know peace, not just know peace, but live it, amen? 
It's one thing to know that we have peace with God, but it's another thing to know how to live it. And so here's the first thing. The first thing is confess. We need to confess. This is a practice that we've gotten out of, right? We need to have a community that we can confess to. It's great to confess to God, Lord, I sin against you and only you. But we need to have some men. We need to have some women in our lives that we can confess our sins to. Amen. So that they could do what? Talk about us? So that they could go and gossip about us? No, so that they can pray for such a one. Amen. And so we need to start being honest with God. Peace begins when we drop the act, right? When we drop the charades and really start getting real with God. And that's what I love about confession. Confessions, confession forces us to get real about God. John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Who is he? God. Amen. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's funny how that works. Justification imputes righteousness to us. And what happens is like this never-ending funnel of unrighteousness as we have a life built on what? Repentance. And so we need to confess. We need to get into the habit of confession. Why do we need to confess? Because here's what confession does. Confession clears the way for peace to flood in. It clears the way for the peace. Have anybody ever confessed and you felt like a weight just... Just lift it off of you. That's the power of confession. That, that, that peace is, is, is flooding into your heart. So start confessing, all right? Two, commit. We need to commit. We need to make peace with God a priority in our lives. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 puts it this way. It says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, right? We can boldly approach the throne of grace um, because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will do what? Will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's about a daily commitment that builds up the trust muscles. Some of us, it's hard for us to trust God because... We're not spending time with God to know the character of God, to know the mind of Christ, to know how loving he can be and how comforting he can be. I had a pastor, I was out playing golf with some pastors, and I asked a question, they, they're big-time leaders, and I was like, man, what, what advice would you give a young man that is really going after his faith and going after his calling and really walking in faith into some, some opportunities and doors that are opening for him and things are really about to break open for him. What, what advice would you give him? The pastor said, spend more time in the presence of God. Spend more time in his presence. And I'm seeing that to be true in my life. And so we need to commit commit, commit to trusting him. And that happens when we spend time in the presence of God. Third but not least, and worship team, you could come forward. Worship team, you could come forward. Celebrate. Celebrate. And so not only do we need to confess, not only do we need to commit more time to, to him, we need to celebrate. We need to finally live like we got some peace. And the funny thing about it is it's hard to talk to some of you. It's hard to talk to some of you. Because when I look at your face, I'm kind of like, man, good night. What are they going through? Because it looks like you're chewing on some lemons and some rocks at the same time, right? And so we need to celebrate. We need to share that joy. John 14, 27 puts it this way. Peace I leave with you. This is what he gives. This is the character of God. He's leaving us with peace. Peace I leave, I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you, I, not, I do not give to you as the world gives. And that's the problem. We think that God has given us peace in the way that the world gives peace. And it's not like that. That's so far from the truth. He said, I don't give it the way that the world gives you. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The peace that he gives to you, it surpasses all understanding and it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. He's not going to take it back. Give me my peace back. No. He'll never leave you 
nor forsake you. This is the reason to smile during your storm. This is the reason for you to laugh in the face of adversity and laugh in the face of our adversary because we have the peace that surpasses all understanding and we could celebrate. It's celebrate worthy, all right? It's time for us to start celebrating because you've got peace with God. So it's time to start letting that peace shows. We need to confess, we need to commit, and we need to celebrate. So what does, it all, what does this all mean? Imagine leaving this room today knowing that no matter, no matter what turbulence hits your proverbial plane, you are already seated in the presence of God, buckled in, and are at peace with God. You need to know that. God is not at war with you. God doesn't have hostility towards you. If you are a friend of God, and a friend of God simply means that you believe, you believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Imagine walking into a stressful situation this week and just feeling calm because you not only have the peace of God, but you're at peace with God. Imagine falling and making a mistake, and I mean missing it bad this week. And you just take a step back and receive his grace, and you repent, and then you have the reassurance of knowing that you have peace with God. God ain't angry at me. He emptied that out on Christ. That's what just gets me about this thing. It's hard. And I'm, can I be vulnerable real quick? Sometimes it's hard for me, and I know others can relate to this, to accept the grace of God. Because there's this nature in me that wants to make it right myself. But I can't. And God knew that, and so he put his son in my place to absorb that wrath. And not only to absorb it, but to make it right. And so now I'm in right standing with God. That's hard for me sometimes. Even being saved as long as I've been saved, that's still hard for me to know that God's grace is that powerful and that he is that loving. And so friends, remember, if you remember anything, if you remember anything from this message today, know that peace, peace with God is not a place. It's a person. And his name is Jesus. Christ. Amen. Amen. So let's stand to our